Now, if you want on this 44 Magnum, you can shoot it single action. Did you mean to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Intoxicated Masculinity. We talk about drinking culture, pop culture, politics, and anything else that comes up. Joining as always is Brandon. Hello, my people. Jim. Hello, everyone. And Kale. Hello, my fellow human beings. Uh, we're going to do one of our very, very uncontroversial topics that makes absolutely no one angry and everybody can totally agree on, which is, of course, gun control and guns in general. Uh, before we get into the tough stuff, let's get into the hard stuff. Brandon, what do you have in the name? I am having some straight up old Forester. Sounds good, Jim. I'm having a margarita with gin. I don't know what that's called. Not sure. Uh, Kale, what are you having? I am having Sagamore Rye, double oaked. Sounds good. I've uh, been to that distillery. It's a very pretty distillery. Uh, and I'm kind of going along with the flow here. Uh, I just uh, decided to go with something real bare bones. So I'm having an early times bottled in bond uh, made by uh, Jim Beam Distilling in Kentucky. Um, so today we're going to talk about guns. Uh, we're going to, I think we're going to kind of split this discussion up into two parts, but we're going to kind of carry right through and, and try to talk about a few things. Um, I think uh, the best way for us to start off um, is to talk about some statistics. Um, so the number one thing I think to talk about is uh, how many guns do we have? Um, so in America, um, we have about 120 uh, guns per resident. I think it's around 350 to 360 million guns in the country, um, which puts us, you know, several miles ahead of every other country on earth. Um, we have significantly more guns. Um, in 2020, which is the last good year, we have numbers of 24,000 uh, gun deaths, um, or excuse me, 45,000 gun deaths, about 24,000 of which are by suicide. Um, so if anybody talks about gun deaths, about half, a little more than half are going to be suicides, the other half are going to be uh, homicides, uh, and then you got a bunch of accidentals and undetermined and uh, things like that. Um, Mass shootings, uh, we've got of the last 12 mass shootings that happened in this country, um, 10 happened in the, two, in the 2000s and, and 2010s. Um, so there's been significantly more mass shootings in the last uh, 20 years than there has been, um, you know, uh, at any point in American history. Um, I think there's, there's some more to get on to you, but uh, uh, Brandon, why don't you start us off? What do you think? Just kind of talk about some of the stats and, and what, what you think about those. Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that the suicide one is is nearly half. I mean, it, it's sad, but it doesn't surprise me. I think, and you know, it's even a it's not even something we bring up in the discussion all that much in presidential debates or something. You could say, "Hey, I'm pro gun control." By that, I mean, you know, making mental health more of an issue. We could wipe out half of gun deaths by just having more of mental health awareness. I mean, how would that even play? What would Republicans even get mad about at that? Well, I think it's, uh, and we'll talk more about sort of uh, issues related, but I also think sometimes when people use mental health, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of mental health uh, care, and I think we all are, um, but sometimes I believe people on the side, uh, on the anti-gun control side, sort of use that as something they say, but they don't actually do anything. I mean, the NRA has not done a great deal to push, uh, you know, Medicare for all or universal mental health care or anything like that. It's more something they just kind of say to, you know. Yeah, play yeah they don't mean it. But I mean, just imagine being able to wipe out half of the gun deaths. I mean, you know, you're, you're never going to stop all suicides either. But I mean, we wouldn't even have to come down to confiscation, just getting people the mental health they need, getting someone they can talk to and get some help. Because well, every the, single one of those lives counts. Every one of those lives matters. And if you well, think, and, out. I don't know anything about psychology, you know, but from a, a, a psychology standpoint, doesn't it seem fair to say that anybody that goes on a mass shooting probably could have used some 
mental health could have used somebody to talk to. I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to diagnose them, but it ha- would have had to have helped. Well, the ratio, uh, the, the, the other problem with guns in relation to suicide, and Jim, I'll get to you in just a second, um, um, is that there's more than just, there, there's several relational factors with guns and suicide. Uh, there's a, an article that's published by uh, Stanford Medicine that I've seen multiple times, and I've seen backing evidence on this in other places before, where just there being a gun in the house increases the risk of suicide. In other yeah. words, uh, aside from everything else, just if you have a gun in the house versus not having a gun in the house, that increases your risk to to uh, commit suicide. Uh, well, also the way suicide I've seen is, it, go ahead. It, it's not it's not even just suicide. It's all types of violence. The gun itself increases the likelihood of that kind of thing. Right, right. Um, but then on top of that, you also have uh, suicides committed by gun are more likely to be successful. Um, yeah. So a lot of people will say, well, if they didn't use a gun, maybe they would have done pills. Well, people that take pills as a, as a form of suicide, we probably should have put up a, 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 a trigger warning on this stuff because there's a lot of a lot of real heavy yeah. stuff going on here. Be nice to um, end it, wouldn't it? Uh, but it also people that, that use uh, guns are significantly more likely to be successful. So if somebody uses pills instead of a gun, um, they're more likely that somebody will find them and help them out or that they will, you know, I mean, you know, the body has a tendency to get rid of things it doesn't like. So you could throw them up. There's, there's a million ways to get rid of those things. Um, but uh, that being said, Jim, I'm sorry, I'll let you talk a little bit uh, on this. See what you think. Um, so specifically on the suicide, uh, some of the things that I've read. Um, have indicated that um, one of the reasons that uh, um, having guns in the house makes suicide more likely is um, there's a real immediacy to um, mental health crisis when it comes to suicide. So anything that can delay someone by 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour can shift them off of that ledge. Um, um, I think that is an absolutely devastatingly excellent point. Um, yeah. I know a lot of veterans that have had, you know, crisis, crises um, and, you know, one had a gun in the house. Thankfully, uh, you know, at that time, the person that came to talk to him was a cop who wasn't uh, like one of the cops we see on television and actually talked him down and helped him out. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of people that that happens to, and they don't have somebody to talk them down. And you're right, that immediacy. Uh, a gun is quick and it's easy. Uh, whereas, you know, pills aren't, you know, going to find, you know, a bridge to, I mean, these, these other things are, are just more difficult. Well, and statistically, it isn't true. They, they don't, if they don't have a gun, they don't opt for something else. They, they think about it more like picturing strangulation or something that just, that gets at you. You don't do it. You don't want people to, I don't know, you, you have yeah. time to think about it. Yeah. I mean, that that's something else I've read too, is that um, oftentimes when people commit suicide, they, not all types of suicide are the same. Like uh, someone that is in mental distress that is really contemplating suicide that often have, um, the way they choose to do that, um, they aren't all interchangeable. Well, there's a there's a quote from the article that says suicide attempts are often impulsive acts driven by transient life crises. You know, uh, a spouse leaving you, your you know, your car dying, you're getting an eviction notice, something like that. Um, most attempts are not fatal, and most people who attempt suicide do not go on to die in a future suicide. Uh, whether a suicide or attempt is fatal depends heavily on the lethality uh, of the method used and firearms are extremely lethal. She's just kind of saying what we're saying is, you know, I mean, people, I mean, there, there are certainly people that have significant depression and suicide is a constant risk. But I think for most people who commit suicide it is an impulsive thing. It is something that happens. They might have other, other risk factors, um, and probably do have other risk factors as well, but it is sort of linked to a an, an event of some kind. And if they have you know less lethal forms of uh, available to them, then they will probably survive and will probably not attempt again. Um, Mike, so. I know we're going to probably link in the down there bits, but could you um, audibly state where you got where, what you're reading from? Oh, it's a, a Stanford uh, Stanford Medicine. Um, 
So it's it's a pretty reputable thing. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I'll put this down below too. But there's the Veterans Christ Line for your veteran who's who's having you know thoughts. Call them. They they help help people out. Um, I want to move on to some of the others. Or, Kale, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Uh, what, what do you have on this uh, first very uh, sunny part of our discussion? Well, well, like you were saying earlier about uh, like if someone decides, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to cut my wrists or I'm going to take this bottle of pills or I'm going to hang myself or something like that. You know, there is a chance that that person, even after making such a dramatic decision, could still be saved. Uh, but the finality of pulling a trigger at point blank range, there, there's there's not a lot of going back from that. Right. It's it's the basic um, lethality of the method is significantly higher than basically. So, I mean, when you just sort of think about it uh, logically when people take pills, I mean, who knows what the actual lethal dose is on, on medications. It's oftentimes tough. Um, again, your body can react and, and throw the pills back up. Um, most people don't know how to properly tie a noose i mean all these other methods have significant problems um i mean even people who cut you, you know you you have clotting in your blood and so people a lot of times people survive those types of things uh, but like you say yeah i mean a, a, a bullet is is very very often lethal uh, just since we were talking stats just real quick um in 2019 there was 39,707 uh gun deaths in the u.s and it, like you said, in 2020, it was 45,222. And that is the highest level ever. And as we stated, it was 54% of them are suicides. Uh, here in Iowa, specifically in our state, uh, in 2019, there were 287 gun deaths in 2019. 79% uh, of those, 79% were suicides. And... Uh in 2020, 353 gun deaths, 263 of those were suicides. Yeah, it's, uh, and I, I've seen debates where uh, some gun advocates will attempt to sort of um, disconnect uh, violent, uh, uh, violent crime gun deaths versus suicides and try to say that suicide shouldn't be counted in there. Um, and to them, I say, uh, suicide's pretty fucking violent. So um, I want to get on to in the U.S. specifically, because the U.S., you know, sort of mentioned at the top how the U.S. has we have a lot of guns. We got a lot of gun deaths um, and it, it sort of we'll hear about the Second Amendment. Um, and I want to have you had it up here a second ago. They were just talking about that on the news tonight. It's one of the issues they're discussing. I basically have the Second Amendment memorized, but I want to make sure I read it off um, so I don't. Um... OK, so it, it probably should have done this off the top, but I think this is as good a, a place as any, because I wanted to talk about some of the law and some of the ways in which guns are are sort of legitimized uh, legally um, in this country. Um, so we're going to start off with the Second Amendment. Um, and this is where a lot of the argument comes from. Um, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, I want to say right off the bat what gun rights advocates will say is they will say that those are two entirely separate thoughts. That, that is the theory. Um, that is the theory behind Heller, which we'll talk about in a minute. That is the theory behind basically all the Second, right, uh, Second Amendment rights people's idea. Um, I find that to be an absolutely ludicrous idea. Um, if there is a sentence with two commas separating out an initial phrase, it is very obvious that it is all one thought. Um, so the idea that the in the first part of that clause, a well-regulated militia is entirely unrelated to the second, uh, the last clause in the sentence uh, saying the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. Um, are clearly connected. Jim, I'd like to go to you first on this. What, what do you think? And I, I know this isn't your your uh, uh, your primary practice in law. And I will say before you can even say it, this is not rec this is not uh, legal advice. Um, and this is just, you know, four guys discussing things. Yeah. Um, so I don't really get that argument. I mean, I understand that the last part says something specific, but 
if you split it into two parts, what does the first part mean? Like it doesn't mean anything. Right. The first part doesn't guarantee any right. If you, if you did, like, if we say what Jim said, which is a good, this is a really good uh, sort of thing to try out. That means the first part, it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of the free state. Dot, dot, dot. Which means nothing, which means right. nothing on its own. So you've just rendered an entire clause meaningless, which in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas of law, if you are rendering part of what's written meaningless, then you probably have the wrong interpretation of what is being written. Well, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of commas too. You're supposed to be able to take out the section in commas and like put the sentence together and have it still make sense. I would agree with that. Having looked at a lot of anti-gun control stuff, Brandon, I don't think their uh, grammar is perhaps entirely up to snuff. I will say there are some leftist gun advocates, the Socialist Rifle Association. Yeah, there is. And, and I, I think we can talk. About, I think we'll talk about that more in a second. I think probably is a better place there. I don't know. Uh, Kale, what does the Second Amendment mean to you? What, what, are those, what do those words kind of mean to you? Well, I don't think you can cherry pick uh, the Bill of Rights or the Constitution as a whole. Uh, people want to argue that oh, the Constitution is well put together, it's well thought out, and this, this is what's protecting me and my rights as a U.S. citizen. But then they want to break off little pieces of it and be like, this is what this part means. No, you can't do that. It's, it's all one thought, as you said. And a well-regulated militia, as you've stated in the past, Mike, is the National Guard. Well, that would certainly be my argument, that essentially uh, the National Guard is something that is controlled uh, primarily by the states and by the governor of the states, um, and it is well regulated. It is controlled by the state um, and the founding fathers. And, and the other thing on top of this, and, and I don't, uh, Jim, I'm not sure how far back your con, con law goes, um, but if you want to know anything about the founding fathers uh, and, and the one thing that most of the founding fathers I think we're pretty uh, uh, of one voice on um, is the founding fathers were terrified of the idea of the mob rule. Uh, I mean, the founding fathers did not want everybody to be able to vote. They didn't want every white person to vote. They didn't want all white men to vote. They only wanted white landowning men to be able to vote. Um, and so the idea that the, the, the founding fathers would want all the people to have all the military weapons to take over the government at any time is ludicrous. It's just not what the founding fathers wanted. I mean, uh, all four of us are significantly more democratic in disposition than uh, the most democratic of any of the founding fathers. Uh, so I wanna get uh, back to what you just said about the militia. And uh, this is something that I probably will talk about later on when we talk about what can be done. Um, but the uh, actual law that governs the National Guard has two different categories of militia. There's a standing militia and there's an ir irregular militia. And I could have the facts, the, the details on this wrong, but it's basically every male that's above 18 and under 47, something like that is considered part of the irregular militia well so, that'd be like the selective service so like the selective service is basically you know um you guys are all in it i guess i'm probably still in it um uh, it's sort of everybody who's eligible for the draft if they ever reinstate it um then also remember there is um uh, and i'm not gonna get too deep into military okay. stuff because nobody cares um but uh, you know there's active u.s army um and air force and marines and all that then you have the national guard active duty, the, Na the National Guard, um, what you, we sort of think is M-Day soldiers, people that just do, uh, you know, two weeks, uh, two weeks a year, one weekend a month kind of thing. Um, and then you have your inactive guard reserves, which are people that are still technically on the rolls, but don't actually drill. And so there's all sorts of levels sort of legally of, of, of where you would stand in that. But that to me, uh, very, very clearly represents a well-regulated militia. It is a group of people that live in states that are controlled by the state government. 
Um, ultimately, the commander in chief of the National Guards is the governor of the state. And it's that's what it is. It, that's what it's sort of meant to be. Um, but, you know, what do I know? Um, just real quickly, and I don't want to go through a bunch of court cases because I don't think that's really helpful to anybody. Um, but I did want to talk about, obviously, one, uh, which is uh, District Columbia versus Heller. Um, now, remember, uh, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written prior uh, by some measure to 2008, um, some 220 years before 2008. Um, so to all the people, uh, we hear this all the time that, you know, we've always understand this, understood that Americans have this inalienable and, and uninfringible and absolutely absolute uh, right to keep and bear arms. Um, but the court cases have not held that out. The Supreme Court over the years has upheld over and upheld over and over and over again uh, states' rights to uh, put reasonable restrictions on gun ownership. Um, and it is not until 2008 in District of Columbia versus Heller where they first uh, where they first do that. Uh, Jim, how much do you know about that case? Um, so I don't know very much about it. I will say some of the stuff that I've read about it in the past um, indicates that the the real um, earth shaking result of the case was that it uh, found that there was a constitutional uh, right based in your person uh, instead of there being kind of a, a public right that um, previously there was a lot of emphasis on um, the public good of uh, gun ownership for a right, well-regulated militia, et cetera. And um, this case kind of threw that to the side and said, no, there really is a, um, a very strong personal right that uh, the state has to have a, a, you know, exceedingly good reason to do any sort of restriction. And it should be stated that Warren Berger, who is a conservative, um, as late as 1992, did not believe in this idea of a, uh, a right to keep and bear arms outside of militia um, that was sort of inalienable. Um, so this is the, the thing I think people don't understand about this is that this interpretation of the Second Amendment is very, very new. It is not something that goes back to the Constitution. It is not something that goes back to the Founding Fathers. It's not something that goes back to Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, this is this is really, really new stuff. And I think people don't understand that. Um, Kale, what, what do you think? Is that me? I'm sorry, you kind of broke up there. Yes, you're Kale. OK, well, it sounded like you went. That's exactly what um, I said. Well, I think that uh, I agree with the interpretation that a well-regulated militia uh, is a particular group of citizens that have, you know, rallying points, a, a base, um, a, a uniform, a, a code that they follow, a set of rules that they follow. Um, and that uh, I've heard the hard argument made in, in public discussions that if you want to bear arms, then you should be in a militia like the National Guard, which makes me pose the question, what do we think of these groups of uh, people that go out on the woods and uh, into the woods on the weekends and call themselves a militia uh, and, 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 you know, align themselves as like freedom fighters against the tyrannical government? Or the Branch Davidians. So what's the first line of the, um, that part of the, the second amendment? Uh, a well-regulated well, militia. Well-regulated? Right. In other words, it has, it literally has well-regulated right in the beginning of it. But again, that's why they always try to separate these things, which is so crazy. And it, it really makes you, it, it almost seems like that's like the beginning of, of like Twitter arguments. Cause it reminds me of that a lot. People making arguments that are so incredibly disingenuous and just viscerally wrong. Um, I mean, I think of stories that I see in the news um, and I can just say, well, that's bullshit. 
And I haven't gone in and researched it, but I just can tell by, you know, the first two sentences of the story that this is BS. Now, if I, if I care to go in and, and, and go and do the deep dive, I know we could, we could disprove it. Um, but it's one of these things where when somebody comes in and says that the well-regulated part of that amendment is supposed to not be taken seriously, um, when in the entire- that convenient? Right. In the entire Bill of Rights, no other right is mentioned well-regulated. They don't say that uh, free speech should be well-regulated. They don't say that your right uh, to be uh, free from quartering troops in your home should be well-regulated. No, they only say that about that one amendment. And they say, well, we're not supposed to pay attention to that. Uh, and that's why I think the idea of the originalists, which we talked about a little bit uh, kind of before we started recording, um, the originalists just, just fall right in their face on this particular argument because they just discount, discount that entire part of the, of the thing. It's, 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 it's ludicrous. So well, and what Kale was saying, the idea that any, like the five of us could just wander into the four of us, <laughs> the four of us could just wander into the woods and be like, we're a militia now. I mean, can we just get together in Mike's house and be like, we're the legislative body now. I mean, I don't know who has the power to hand out titles, but I mean, it seems like just anybody can do that. I mean, it's how do would you well regulate? Is it just up to Kale to well regulate us and how we run our militia? This is the what part, by the, the way. One? How is that a good idea, Brandon? This is the part, by the way. Well, I will edit in a picture of uh, Ralph Wiggum from The Simpsons holding a gun, saying, "I'm a militia." <laughs> um there's one last law i wanted to talk about and i wanted to get one too uh, uh, oh well we'll have more than one um and that is uh the dickey amendment uh which is a funny name we can't deny that it is a funny name the dickey amendment um but it's really important so this they put in first as a rider on an omnibus spending bill in 1996 um and it's sort of complicated but what it effectively did is it prevented the cdc um, from studying gun violence and the effects of gun violence, yeah. um, which is a particularly strange, authoritarian, weird thing to put into a bill um, that is just an omnibus spending bill. Um, now, apparently that, that has lapsed now. Uh, the, the, the CDC can study these things, um, but that was put in in 1996 and it wasn't clarified until uh, 2018. Um, so we're talking for 22 years the CDC uh, was avoiding doing any studies on gun violence because they were afraid they would be penalized. That's insane. Uh, Jim, were you familiar with the Dickey Amendment? Uh, just most of what you said. Um, so I guess you have to ask yourself, like, why was that necessary? Why, do people, why is there an interest in not studying gun violence it seems like if if guns are great and uh more guns is better uh, because more freedom and you know good guys with guns stop bad guys with guns then why aren't we studying how awesome it is that we have more i want to yeah, interject right there and say that i don't think it has anything to do with the right to bear arms i think it has to do with gun sales why, Kale, are you implying that we live in some kind of a capitalist utopia where uh, people would value their sales over the lives of the citizens? I'm, I'm absolutely shocked at you. Shocked, I say. I'm, I'm downright insinuating it, yes. Well, Kale's clearly lost his mind and is suggesting crazy things, so we should probably move on. <laughs> um, no, okay, obviously you're uh, 150 percent right. You know the, the, the one thing that people don't talk about about the NRA, um, is that when you talk about, uh, you know, you look at polling around uh, gun control issues, um, even gun owners, even the vast majority of gun owners are not against uh, background checks and closing the gun show loophole. These things are, are actually pretty popular, you know, 70 to 80 percent popularity in this country. Um, but the NRA doesn't support any of them. And people seem to be under the impression that the NRA is this just sort of independent pro-gun organization, which is exactly what the NRA would like you to believe. Unfortunately, that's not what the NRA is. What the NRA is the lobbying organization for the uh, weapon manufacturing companies. 
Um, that's why the NRA is against literally any restrictions on guns. Um, there was a bill a while ago to uh, ban people on the terrorist watch list from buying guns. Um, I will give you two guesses as to which side of that uh, debate the NRA was on. Uh, and the first one does not count. Um, the NRA is not a gun owners organization. The NRA is a gun manufacturers association. Well, I mean, there's it with fingerprint technology on our phones the way it is and GPS tracking the way it is. We could easily make it so like guns could have GPS and fingerprint technology. Like, Absolutely. Like you could tell if it was in with, within like 100 yards of a school and just shut down. That would be pretty easy technology to do. There is absolutely technology out there um, that is fingerprint recognizable that will not fire unless uh, the registered owner has their fingerprint on it. Um, And the NRA is absolutely against it. But you know what they are for? Armor piercing ammunition, because that's what the average duck hunter needs, uh, because ducks have apparently started buying bulletproof vests. They fitted out ducks like Deathwing. Darkwing Duck, Brandon. Darkwing, come on. That's what I was thinking. Or Deathwing from World of Warcraft. I'm happy with that yeah. too. Um, okay. You're going to need piercing Brandon, you go- to take care of that drag. <laughs> I did want to say about the Mulford Act. So in 1967, there was a uh, Republican named Don Mulford who uh, uh, came up with a gun control thing in the state of California. And the governor at the time, a man named Ronald Reagan, signed it. And the entire reason they came up with his goal of disarming the Black Panther Party. It was the first indication of uh, gun control in the country, and it was started by Republicans and Ronald Reagan because Black people had guns. Yeah, that's a great point. That's another kind of uh, just crazy thing that, you know, the only time you can get Republicans to vote in favor of gun control is when you show them that Black people could own guns. It's just, uh, and they could show up and walk around with them just like you wanted to. Right. Right. It's, uh, it's incredible. Um, <laughs> yeah. And there, there was this time in the country when showing up at like the state cap, I think it was a state capital with guns was a shocking event. Um, I'll tell you what, if you want to, uh, hold on to something that's dangerous to the establishment in this country, you don't want to hold a gun. You want to hold a ballot. Um, because that's about the only thing uh, that is a danger to the to the uh, establishment in this country. Um, I have a quick question for Jim, a uh, legal professional here. I know like you, you, we've said it's kind of out of your wheelhouse, but um, now when you say, you know, uh, that the Black Panthers wanted to be seen in public with, with their weapons the same way that the people they felt were against them were being seen in public with their weapons, um how does how does the brandishing a weapon rule come into that because you can't just walk around waving a gun around out in public you know i really don't know anything about uh the rules on brandishing a gun um so brand i've and kale that's a good question because i've asked that a lot before because i feel like there is a ton of brandishing weapons. In fact, there was a couple in that, uh, the, the rich couple that was supposedly defending their home. Um, oh, yeah. People that were walking by um, and they had weapons out and were pointing them. Um, so the official definition, and this is, you know, the one thing to, to say about a big caveat with anything to do with law is all these laws or the vast majority of these laws are state laws. Um, so whatever the law says in one state, it could say, you know, something slightly different or possibly vastly different, um, in another state. Um, but I wanted to read a definition here, uh, brandishing a weapon in the presence of someone else simply means there was another person present when you exhibited your deadly weapon, a rude or threatening manner, uh, oh, in a, in a rude or threatening manner. Um, so it kind of depends. I mean, what is rude or threatening? Um, I would argue. And how does that apply in stand your ground law states? Well, I think it's different if if you have, say, a pistol holstered on your hip, and you're like, "Look, there's my gun," versus here, here's my gun. I think that's that's a little more threatening. Well, and if 
Trayvon Martin had had a gun instead of Skittles and tea, would Republicans like him more or is it still the whole being black thing? I think the case you brought up sort of illustrates where they would stand on that particular issue. Um, Jim, talking of, uh, you have uh, some statistics right behind you. Do you want to talk about those? Uh, yeah. So, you know, we've got everything figured out in our country and everything's great. So we're, uh, excuse me, we're off the charts. We're awesome. We're better. We're than number one. Else. Number yeah. one. Number one. No. Number one. I mean, it, it's not even close. Uh, I think number two is a, uh, is that Cuba? Um, and no one's even even close. So like you were saying, some people don't want to count suicides. So even if you counted this, the suicides in uh, Cuba and you didn't count the suicides in the United States and you cut our number in half, we'd still have more than Cuba and three times more than Canada. And I don't know, that's like seven times more than most of the other countries. Um, 10 times more than Australia, who uh, I hope we talk about that a little bit more later. Um, past used to have very uh, liberal gun laws and had some mass shootings. And then, hey Jim, why don't you just talk about Australia? Because I think there's a, a good lead in for us. Why don't you talk about it now? Um, <clears throat> so I don't really have the dates uh, of when this happened, but uh, from what I've read, uh, Australia had um, probably not as uh, permissive of gun laws as we have here, but fairly permissive. And they had a rash of mass shootings and one particularly terrible mass shooting. And they decided that, you know, they needed to make a change. And so they really restricted uh, the types of guns, uh, the types of uh like magazines you could have, et cetera. And it really, I mean, you can see in the chart, it really um, changed uh, the, the kind of homicides that they were seeing per year. I One, believe it was the Port Arthur massacre in uh, April 28, 1986. Um, was that? Which, uh, hold on. It was uh, uh, 34. Five deaths, uh, 35 deaths, 24 injuries. Um, I remember the story of a seemingly normal uh, young man uh, somewhere around 20 or something like that uh, was at like a beach or something, pulled out a M16 style rifle and just started shooting people on the beach, went into a diner started shooting people in the diner and then went down the road and started shooting at some other place too is that um i'm not 100 percent sure to be honest it's a uh, um martin bryant was the uh, i hate to say their names but uh that was yeah. the person who committed day um so the article that i read about this and it's been a little while but um had some uh, people from the government commenting on the effectiveness of the law. And they brought up a point that I, uh, I've i heard a lot of times, which is if you limit the kind of guns that law-abiding citizens can have, only the criminals will have the really, really dangerous guns. And Hey, Jim, let me break in because I think this is something kind of interesting. Uh, and I think this is you, you present a great way to kind of intro into this. So we've all heard some of the uh, best arguments against gun control um, that the that the people on the right have. So that is probably number one. Um, if you only if, if you ban guns, then only criminals will have guns. So why don't you talk about that a little bit and then say whether you think that's a valid argument or think that's not a valid argument? So, you know, I can understand the argument and it makes some plausible sense. Uh, I just wanted to bring it up while we were talking to about Australia because that wasn't their experience when they restricted the type of guns generally available to the public. What happened is, um, and, and again, it's been a while, so I could be wrong on the details, but I think uh, they kind of did a part of the gun control was a buyback policy to buy back the guns and then destroy them. And 
it's the power of economics. What happened was the banned guns um, that got bought back, there's fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer of them. Well, if you're a criminal and you want to acquire one of these illegal guns that there are fewer and fewer and fewer of, the price of them goes up and up and up and up to the point where there's, it's out of the range of possibility for a petty criminal or um, someone to just easily acquire. They're not, they're not, their country's not flooded with guns like we are. So it's not easy for a criminal to acquire one of these things. That's interesting. That makes a lot of sense. It was called the uh, National Firearms Agreement. And yeah, the buyback and voluntary uh, surrenders, they collected and destroyed more than a million guns. Um, and their current laws, since we're on Australia, uh, is very interesting. I really like the way it's worded. Uh, you in order to have and they and any of the top six countries that are uh, listed as stricter uh, gun regulated countries um, any of the weapons you're going to see are mostly going to be shotguns and air rifles those are those are the two categories that they are lenient with uh, at all and um, in Australia it has to you have to be licensed. Your weapon has to be registered. And the best part is you have to have a good reason not to ha- or a good reason to have it. And one of those good reasons is not self-defense. It's specifically in the rules that you can't just claim I need this gun for self-defense to, to have a, to have a, a logical reason to have a firearm. Um, I think it should be noted that uh, in the uh, in the time since 1996, uh, which is the big uh, mass shooting in Australia, uh, they killed 35 people. Since then, I think there's been about 60 or 65 people killed in Australia in mass shootings. So that's since 1996, which is now going to be uh, 20, what, uh, 26 years um, in the United States, this is according to Every Town, which is a uh, uh, a gun control website. So um, you could verify that in non gun control states, but or gun control sites, this is a good one. Um, there was 136 people killed in mass shootings uh, last year in the United States, um, mm. in in one year. So we more than doubled Australia's total uh, mass shooting deaths in the last 26 years in one year. Um, if you get to Japan statistics, uh, which again, we can start to get into international too, um, then, you know, I mean, Japan has virtually no gun deaths. I mean, virtually none. Uh, it's not exactly zero. I think they might have a few every year, uh, but that's about it. Uh, Brent, I want to go to you. So uh, we had uh, Jim kind of talk about one of our, what are, what are the arguments you hear most, the sort of pro-gun arguments and do you think that argument holds water? Uh, the, the, the one he talked about was the idea um, that uh, if you take away, if, if you ban guns, then only criminals will own guns. And he sort of talked about that. So what argument, what, what sort of pro-gun argument do you hear a lot? And do you feel that argument holds water? Uh, I think the one I'm most sympathetic to is that gun control is kind of a privileged stance. Like people in minority communities who uh, do not feel in any way represented or protected by local law enforcement or something can use a, a gun. And while I understand that the on the one side, just having a gun probably means you're going to get shot, it's come to the point where it kind of seems like just being a minority means you're going to get shot. I can, I, I often, find, I think that's the argument that I find mo- myself being most sympathetic with. So do you think that argument holds water? Um, and if so, why, or why not? Or, or what do you, what do you see as the, you know, sort of weigh, weigh them out? See, why do you I, think it does or doesn't? Well, my, my only issue is I am not a minority in any sense of the word. So my experience can't really speak to it. Um, I tend to want to take their word for it. 
I understand what they're saying. I understand why they would be very reluctant to call police to their neighborhood because that doesn't work out well for them a lot of times. There's a, a, the current prime minister of India, Modi, uh, his forces massacred an entire uh, uh, Muslim village back when he was the governor of a province. He's and, not great. Spoiler alert. No. Over. He's a, he's a fascist, but had those Muslims had guns, maybe they could have fought back. They still died either way, but maybe they could have deterred. Maybe it could have bought some time for some people to escape. I, I think it does hold water. I think it's the closest thing that does other than being an anarchist myself and not really liking the idea of there even being a hierarchy so powerful that it could come into 300 million people's homes and take things from them. But um, I would say uh, it holds some water, uh, maybe not a lot of water. Um, and I think actually uh, what you said is going to lead into, and Kale, I'm going to have you go last uh, because I have one that kind of, um, um, sort of jibes with what Brandon was talking about. And the argument that I hear all the time is that a, uh, um, a totalitarian government, American government could come and, and, you know, be totalitarian and take people's guns away. Uh, and that's why we need guns to prevent the government from taking our guns away. Um, this is an argument that I am intensely infuriated by. Um, I was in the army and, um, uh, I was in Iraq. I, I know what the military can do. And I know that uh, three people with Glocks are not going to prevent the government from doing anything if, if they have decided that's what they're going to do. Um, if the military is ordered into people's neighborhoods to take their guns away, uh, then take their guns, they will. Um, the military, right. the I military would say has, that. has fighters. The military has UAVs. The military has attack helicopters. They have tanks. Um, but I would and, say my argument isn't that local people could defend themselves against the military. No, no, no. I, I wasn't saying it was a direct contravention. Let me let me clarify. I'm not saying that I'm I'm uh, directly coming back against what you're saying. What I'm what I my argument is sort of against the people that are your right wing militia people that are like we're going to prevent the government from coming and taking our whatevers. Um, no, you're not. And no, you're not. Uh, now, when you're, you're talking about somebody who is living in a, a neighborhood that is. Uh, uh, perhaps sees a lot of violence. I understand what you're saying. And I, I get that. That's why I said that I feel like that argument holds some water, but maybe not all the water. Um, but when it comes to the idea that you with your AK-47 and your canteen are going to stop uh, the first cavalry division from taking over your, you know, trailer, you're not. Uh, well, because if, if I'm, if I'm there, to if I'm there, I can see you from 3,000 feet on on uh, on uh, IR, um, and so can the Apache helicopters, and so can the AC-130, and so can the tanks, and so can everybody else. So it's just it's a ludicrous argument. Well, and we've been to Pima Air Museum in Tucson, where they have an 810 war dog, and I can't yeah. imagine what handgun you're going to have that will do anything. Slow and low, baby. There's a terrifying aircraft right there um so uh jim and kale um the the arguments that brandon and i were talking about i i, I kind of left you guys out because I, I thought the one i was going to talk about was sort of related to what he was talking about not directly but kind of close do you guys have uh something to comment on either one of those i i do uh jim do you you should go ahead okay well um i could understand the urge to want to arm yourself and protect yourself if you lived in say a a low income neighborhood or a neighborhood that's been traditionally redlined or uh just generally speaking is a little shady and you don't feel necessarily safe all the time um i don't think that's a great reason but i understand it um and like, I think that's like, changing a little bit what I said, but well, I mean, I'm elaborating then. Um, but like, and like you were saying, like, uh, okay, the argument that you hear about, uh, oh, I'm gonna use my weapons to defend myself against a tyrannical government, uh, like when Modi had his people go into a neighborhood and just wipe people out, 
that's a tyrannical government. I don't see that happening here in the U.S. ever. Uh, and like Mike was saying, if the military, or if the government decided they were going to implement military force and be like, we're going to come take your stuff, he's right. There's nothing you could do to stop them. There is nothing you could do to stand up to that kind of firepower, that kind of communication line, that kind of control. There, there's no way you could possibly stop that. Um, I don't, I don't know what your plan is, how you would, and, uh, and here's the thing though, they would never do that. The U S government is never going to come down like a hammer on your little town and try to control you because you're already under control. You're a U.S. citizen. If you're going to work, paying your taxes and, and you know doing all the things that most Americans do, you're already doing what they want you to do. You're already under control. Open your but eyes. Uh, but again, I, I'm not saying that a, a, an individual is going to take on the government or anything, but I mean, imagine if Matthew Shepard had a gun. Even if he didn't use it, he might have been able to scare off the people that beat him to death and left him tied into a field. I mean, well, and, and Brandon, I'd like an admission that uh, I'll, I'll make a personal admission that supports your case. Um, I used to work in a pawn shop uh, in uh, the town I went to college in, and it wasn't in like a super sketchy neighborhood or anything. But, you know, I mean, no neighborhood's 100 percent safe. Um, and when I went to work and came back from work, I had a little 38 in my pocket and. I'll admit that because not, I wasn't terrified. I wasn't like, oh my God, something's going to happen, but I felt safer with it there. Um, and so I, I totally understand the idea of people who don't feel safe where they are for whatever, a variety of reasons. And I understand that. I guess what the, the, the argument that I would make against what you're saying is sort of more one in the aggregate rather than in the personal, because I sort of, I sort of get the idea of people's idea or people's um, desire to have a gun, especially if they live someplace where they don't feel safe. Um, but I also think that in the aggregate, the more guns we have, the less safe we are. Well, so and I, I think capitalism contributes to societal ills that lead to violence. Yes. I think we could probably do away with a bunch of that by doing away with capitalism. I think if we went to an anarchist state or even just down the road towards such a thing, stopping by in a socialist state or something, just I think we could for do cookies, away with maybe some coffee. A, just do away with a lot of the reasons that gun violence happens in the first place. I think we could I could definitely get on board with completely disarming the American government and all police. Give him a baton, maybe. Well, that, that was going to be my comment, um, is uh, it's hard to see where we could be. Um, but if you look at other countries, like um, specifically in, with uh, cops, uh, I've heard that Great Britain is an example of this, where most cops don't have guns because Nobody has guns. Yeah, actually, they actually have a special unit just for gun violence in, in the UK police. You mean to like commit it? They're, they're, they're the, there's a special unit that handles gun violence. Yeah, and, and instead here, I mean, you're comparing your average cop in Great Britain not having a gun at all, not needing a gun, to images of our militarized police running around in SWAT gear and on military vehicles, you know, when there's protests in the street. Um, it's, uh, it's, I, I really, I just don't understand how we got here. I, uh, so Jim, I, I have an interesting story. I don't know if it's a story, interesting experience based on that. Cause I agree a hundred percent that the militarization of the police is just incredible. Yes. Um, and, uh, I, so I had had my truck towed because I had the bad sense to park it on the street and not look at it every single day. And some, a next door neighbor reported it to the police. So it was a, it was a criminal truck. <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a wanted truck. Um, that had the that bad truck sense. Shot my paw. 
that had the bad sense to be parked 30 feet from my house. And so they towed it and I had to go down to the police station and pay them money to tow the car that I didn't want them to tow, which I thought was an interesting experience. Um, and uh, at the police station, uh, thankfully, the cop that I talked to was actually very nice and sort of hated the tow uh, agency. Um, uh, if you could look at my Yelp review on this particular tow agency, they are absolute scumbags. Um, and he hates them too and hates the fact they tow these because it just brings them more work um, and just gives this tow truck company money. But when I was down there, I saw this picture of a whole bunch of these uh, Des Moines police and they're all dressed up like they're in the military and taking this big a uh, smiley faced photo out somewhere in the field. Um, and I got to say as a veteran, it fucking pissed me off. Um, Cause I, I was like, you want to join the military, go join the military. Cause that's not what the, the job of people, the job of police officers is not the job of the military. Um, I mean, I remember, well, and we won't mention my names or anything, but I remember, you know, the favorite cop there in Madrid. Um, and like, it was all about like, shutting things down just like making sure things calm down like de-escalating all this stuff talking to people um and you know where i in my in my town up a little north in boone you know when i was a kid you would see that to some degree too of this idea of de-escalation of like we're not here to just crack heads we're here to make everything you know civil yeah, um, you're not supposed to be an occupying force you're right. supposed to be and and you can argue that what they did when we were a kid is a little let's say fascisty light of just like everybody calm down and nobody make too much noise. Um, but I'll take that over the new ultra militarized crack. Everybody's goddamn head uh, mentality that we have today. Um, well, Jim, and a little privilege too. I'm sure, you know, black communities in the South have always thought of them as overly militarized. If oh, absolutely. Worse. absolutely. Someone is a police officer and some of them might be veterans. Uh, a lot of yeah, them it's possible, people. but, but, um it, 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 it say your job is you're a police officer uh and then you're talking about you know back in the day when people would be like oh there's the cop okay everybody calm down there's the cop you know and as versus now it's like oh shit there's a cop i might die today like for example if uh, the police officers came across um a bunch of hoodlums in a parking lot uh beating a car with an inch of its life um and the police officers were like, why are there 20 people surrounding a car, hitting it with baseball bats? I'm, at, I'm talking about a totally hypothetical situation here, obviously, and not something that all three of us were personally involved in. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and their response was to tell us that we had to clean up after ourselves. <laughs> and not as today, where they would have shot tear gas into the, into the particular lot we we're in. Car, um, you don't care. Jim, I want to get your final thoughts on that one. Then we'll go to, to Kale for his his uh, uh, last gun argument defense thing. So I'll just say that um, attitude and optics matter. Uh, I think that when the police arm themselves like that, um, that they're creating uh, an image that they project and I think it affects them too, how they see their job. And I think if you dress up like your military, then you're going to be perceived like military. You're going to perceive yourself like military. And that's not Definitely everyone. That's not every cop. Um, and that's not every citizen's experience. But on the, in the aggregate, I, I don't think it's helpful. There's a, there's a great uh, uh, quote by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, by the way, if you're playing the intoxicated masculinity drinking game um, and you're waiting for me to do a Kurt Vonnegut quote, drink up. Um, uh, in the end of Mother Night, he has uh, what is the only moral to any of the stories that he's ever written. And the moral is uh, we are who we pretend to be. So we must be careful who we pretend to be. Um, so if our police are pretending to be professionals, who, I mean, I, I think back to the cops in, in uh, police Academy, you know, it's a dumb movie, but like they wear button up shirts and hats and they look like professional people. They look like people that are walking down the street and, you know, looking around and doing all this stuff. Um, and so people react to those people and they react to the people react to them uh, in a way that these are professional people that are trying to keep the peace and, and all this. Uh, whereas now they're all dressed like they think they're in, you know, Fallujah and they're not. 
Anyway, well, uh, Kale. I'm oh, sorry, Brandon, go ahead. Well, and you were saying earlier about how just having the presence of a gun entices certain reactions. Now imagine everybody has a, a gun and you're told that you're the sheepdog and that you're supposed to be protecting the lambs from the wolves or whatever the fuck that means. God, I hate analogies. But well, I mean, yes. literally, this is what they train them. This is, I mean, I've seen videos of the guy saying that kind of thing. So now you're totally like, I fear for my life. It's, it's like the guy on South Park shouting, got to thin the herd. I mean, it's just something you say before you start shooting things in the face. I mean, it's coming straight for us. Yeah. Yeah. So what is an argument that you hear oftentimes a uh, pro gun argument? Um, by the way, spoiler alert, most of us are in favor of gun control. I'm not sure people didn't get that by this point, but just what? In case didn't. Um, yeah. What's an argument you hear about? This chance uh, for a spit take, Jim. Um, or it, it, uh, uh, an argument that anti-gun control people make uh, that you hear oftentimes, and do you think that argument holds water or do you think it doesn't and why? Well, let's see. We've covered self-defense. We've covered tyrannical government. Um, and we've covered if uh, we ban guns, then only criminals okay. will have well, guns. Here, we're in Iowa, so we'll just go to the obvious one. I need it for hunting. Or I want it for hunting. Hunting people? Uh, no, this this isn't a nice team movie. Yeah, I was being sorry. Or a Van Damme movie. Uh, but anyway, no, uh, hunting. And, and in, in all these uh, countries, uh, like, okay, specifically uh, Singapore, China, and Japan are three that kind of get to this point where the only people that who are allowed to even buy a gun are people who are claiming you know hunting rights or hunting privileges and i think that's something else we need to address is rights versus privileges because there is a difference if something can be taken away from you it's not a right it's a privilege but uh, a right can be taken away from you. I was going to say, rights can totally be taken away from you. <laughs> yeah. They're not real actual things. Okay. Well, uh, as far as the hunting argument goes, um, there is no reason in, in the modern world, uh, in the markets that we have, in the, in the availability of products that we have, why you would need to go out and and forage for sustenance you don't need to do that you want to do that you don't need to do that and i feel like if people just approach the argument from a more honest standpoint of i don't you know instead of saying i need this for this just say i want this this is what I want, because that's what you're really saying is I want this. Um, because you don't need it. You can go to a supermarket, you can go to a gas station, you can go anywhere. And thanks, capitalism, you have cash, you could just buy the thing that you are going to go out in the woods for three and a half hours and track down and shoot and rip its guts out and skin it off and drag it back to your truck. Um, you know, or you could go get a cheeseburger. I mean, it, it, if it's for sport, then just say it's for sport. Just admit that it's just a hobby. It is just a hobby. It well, is think, not a need. I think, Kale, an important distinction there, and this gets us into sort of the weeds on this stuff a little bit, which is maybe where we should be to some degree, of, okay, you want to go hunting. I'm not against hunting. I love the taste of venison. I, I don't mind hunting at all. But what do you need for hunting? Because if you're going out with an over-under shotgun, uh, which contains two rounds of ammunition, uh, to hunt deer, um, then I can work with you. I mean, I am, I am probably the most opposed to guns, maybe in this particular uh, group right here, but I can work with that. I'm not saying you can't have anything. Uh, I mean, there is a thing called a duck plug. Uh, Kale, can you describe what a duck plug is? Uh, you mean the choke? 
it's a thing that, that it lets you only put so many rounds into a because like when you're hunting duck you uh, want to put so many rounds okay, yeah there's an extension because you can actually get uh pump action shotguns that'll hold up to nine rounds right and they're and they're limiting you uh i think the standard is seven but i think for a duck plug it Knocks it down to what three or four or something like that. I think it's probably three or four, and I'll I'll, I'll put in below what what it is. But yeah, um, and so uh, if you're hunting duck, then the government is restricting how many bullets you can use because that's part of you know the way it works. Um, so and so if you so if you're telling more me rights in this regard than I do, they do. Um, but I mean, arguably it tastes better. But uh, but the, but the thing, but the, but the point is, um, you don't need. Uh, an AR-15 to hunt ducks. Um, in fact, nobody that I know is using an AR-15 really in any hunting um, because it has a 30-round detachable magazine, um, which can be relatively easily converted um, given the right tools to be a fully automatic weapon. Um, you don't need that for hunting. You just don't. Uh, in fact, most people would say uh, hunting ducks or things like that, uh, an AR-15 is probably the last thing you need. Uh, I mean, even the idea of a high powered rifle, um, you know, there's a lot of high powered rifles out there that are, have some pretty powerful ammunition, some powerful rounds, um, but they hold three rounds and hunters aren't complaining about that. Um, there are no duck hunters out there that are saying, I want my seven, six, two, uh, rifle that I used to hunt, uh, deer to have 45 round magazines because they don't need that because no hunter needs that. <laughs> Well, they would take it as embarrassing if they absolutely they would take it as rounds. embarrassing. Well, um, and because they would say, "I need one round." When you do hunt, uh, there are certain regulations to the hunting as well. There, there are certain rules, certain seasons. Uh, for uh, deer, we'll say there's a shotgun season, there's a rifle season, there's a, a bow, bow season, season. Um, a well-regulated hunting season. Yeah. yeah. By the so way, like, can I just say off the top of my head, like bow hunting season, dry, like who can actually kill a deer with a bow? Like, I feel like if you killed a deer with a bow, you won. You got it. You're, it's yours. You're fine. Well, you're, up, you're up on a stand and you got piss on your boots. And <laughs> you're being very quiet and just and waiting. And I think that's something I believe else. the phrase is that way, that way quiet. Uh, like, like I will take nothing away from a passionate hunter, uh, someone that believes in following the rules, doing it the right way, and just enjoying their hobby. I'm not here to step on your toes or push you out of your tree or whatever. Um, it, what we're talking about is the people that are like, I need these 19 you know, semi-automatic rifles that each have 30 round magazines uh, because, you know, the Russians are going to invade my farmhouse. It's, it, there's, there's no logical reasoning behind that. It's Yeah, it's, in my experience, those Venn diagrams do not line up. Um, I mean, people that are really enthusiastic hunters, and I think we live in Iowa, we all know enthusiastic hunters, I think. Um, and your super gun nut, I have 25 AR-15s are just not, I mean, there's some crossover there, but they are not, they're different personalities of people. Um, and I am not somebody who wants to say hunters can't hunt. I think it's fine as long as it's within certain parameters. Um, I think going forward, we should probably close out this episode, but I think that we should close out by saying uh, just real quickly, what we think should happen. Just and uh, next episode, we're going to get into a little more detail with some of the more ephemeral aspects to this. You know, we'll talk about the media, talk about uh, 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 things that obstruct what we want to do. But right now, uh, Brandon, what would you like to see uh, the gun laws be? Well, if you were making the gun laws tomorrow, what what would they be? Well, first and foremost, I would completely disarm the police. Um, second, I would add. Uh, fingerprint and GPS technology to all new guns. And then I would offer a, an extremely generous buyback plan. I would say 10,000 per gun, just crank out the money, spend it, you know, get people so much that it could mean a new car. It could mean paying off bills. It could mean paying off the rent for an entire year or something. Just, 
I mean, even if they brought in, you know, old broken ones that they, you know, had been collecting on the street or something, who cares? Whatever. Just make it extremely generous. Make it worth their time. Make it so so much that it would be silly not to do it. Sounds good. Jim, what about you? Uh, the first thing I think that would be helpful is to require gun insurance. Um, just like you know, most states require for cars. Um, and the you know, NRA, by the way, just put out a hit on you for even mentioning that. <laughs> right. Um, and, and there's all sorts of things you could do with it, right? Your rate, like with a car, could depend on what kind of thing you're insuring. You know, if you're insuring a handgun or a hunting rifle, your rate's probably going to be pretty low. If you're insuring, you know, uh, AR-15 with one of those gigantic circular magazines that holds 200 bullets, uh, maybe you're going to be paying a higher rate. And, and if it's uh, red, it's even more. And, you know, the proceeds from the insurance could be used to pay, pay uh, for damages or victims of gun violence. Um, That's such a good idea, dude. So the, the other thing I kind of alluded to earlier is... Uh, let's stop regulating guns and start regulating the militia. Um, like I said, uh, from, from what I understand, there's still laws on the books about that the United States has a regular militia and an irregular militia and the regular militia is the National Guard and the irregular militia is everybody else with some age restrictions. And who can be? What's that, Cam? Who could be drafted in case? Uh, yeah, but I don't think the militia law requires drafting. I think the governor just says, hey, we have a crisis. We need to organize a militia. Everybody that fits in this age category uh, is eligible to be part of the militia. Um, and <clears throat> if you're eligible to be part of the militia and you're being regulated, why can't the governor say, hey, uh, if you have a firearm that falls within these ranges of things that we consider militia firearms, like say it's AR-15s, then um, we require that you keep a lock on it, or we require that you have it in a gun safe, or we require that you not have it loaded. So to, I'm, that's my- I'm on board. I'm on board. Kale, what about you? Uh, you're making the new gun laws tomorrow. What do you What do you want to do? Well, I feel like Brandon made some good points, and and Jim made some good points. Uh, I would go on to say that for for me, for a personal expect uh, perspective, like I have friends and family who are gun owners. Some of them more avidly than others. Uh, and I would just like to see regulation, just regulation, regulation, regulation. There are rules for a reason. Um, and one of the ideas that I have, uh, is that stay like, like I have a CDL, uh, cause I drive for a living. So people can have a regular license for just driving a regular car. And, and then you get a little bit different license so you can have a little bit bigger vehicle. And then another license to get a little bit bigger vehicle, then another license for another bit bigger vehicle. And then there's additions to those licenses. You can get certifications for carrying certain types of materials and things like that. And I feel like if, if, because honestly, I don't see us getting rid of uh, guns in our lifetime. I don't see it ever happening uh, as long as we're alive. But as long as we can restrict and regulate how they are used and, and who gets to use them, that's a step in the right direction. So I think that like the more... Uh, risk assessment there is with a particular kind of weapon you should have to pass 
uh, certain exams, get certif certifications and, and things like that. And not just one of those, like, look, I got this card that says I can carry a concealed look. No, not like that. Like, no, this thing can do this much damage. So I need to know without a doubt that you know exactly what's going to happen before you even touch that thing. I think you guys all make some really good points and I will be the, uh, I'll be the bad guy. Um, I ban basically all guns. Uh, the only thing I wouldn't ban is shotguns uh, with very limited capacities, possibly high powered rifles with extremely limited capacities, one to two rounds. Um, and I don't think anybody needs to have a handgun. Um, and that includes police. So, uh, by the way, there was one other stat we were talking about uh, uh, sort of laws. And the one thing that I, I sort of say this because I think it's something that people talking to family members who are super pro gun will hear. Um, they will hear the idea that Hitler banned guns right before World War II, um, which sounds great, except he didn't. Um, the uh, heavy uh, uh, gun restrictions came in 1928 uh, when Hitler uh, was not in charge. Um, and when Hitler took charge, they actually um, uh, lowered the restrictions on guns. So Hitler didn't take anybody's guns. He just didn't. He gave lots of other people guns. Um, that being said, um, that's all that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to get back to you next week and talk a little bit more about guns, but in kind of a different way. Um, but I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe, and have a good drink and have a good day. Oh, that was smart. <laughs>